I'm Drew Stevenson, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about the Supreme Court case Rust v. Sullivan from 1991. Our focus here is going to be on Chevron deference and the avoidance canon. And for my students, um, keep in mind we have kind of two big doctrines of statutory interpretation that come together in this case. The first is Chevron deference. So sometimes when Congress passes a statute, they <clears throat> leave some uh, uh, details unclear, right? So there's either terms that could be construed to mean different things, or the statute is just silent on some uh, point. And then what courts will do is they may defer to the regulatory agency that the statute is addressed to or that is entrusted by Congress with implementing um, that statute because the agent with the idea that the agency should have first dibs at filling in the gaps um, and uh, figuring out what the statute means as long as the agency is being reasonable. And that's Chevron deference in a nutshell. In the cases after Chevron, it gets a little complicated and especially when we have a constitutional problem like here. And then we also have something called the avoidance canon. And there's a great quote um, from the Supreme Court uh, that I'm gonna get to at the end from a more recent opinion. The avoidance canon has been expressed pretty differently over the years by different justices on the court. But the idea is generally that the court should try to find a way to interpret a statute that doesn't even give rise to a constitutional question if possible. And so the, the question with the avoidance canon then is if we're trying to avoid finding a constitutional problem in the statute, in other words, let's, let's interpret the statute in the way that preserves it, it, it saves it, that preserves its constitutionality. How do we do that at the same time that we're trying to defer to an agency's interpretation of the statute? And that's what we wanna talk about with Rust v. Sullivan here. Now, this is an a case about abortion and students, everybody feels very strongly. A lot of people have very strong opinions one way or the other about this. And we're actually not going to be talking about abortion rights in this case um, per se, or the courts um, evolving jurisprudence on abortion um, as expressed in this case. Here, we're really focused on how it talks about Chevron deference and this idea of an avoidance canon. So let's start with the statute. Title 10 of the Public Health Service Act provides for federal grant support for family planning clinics, but it states that none of this federal money, quote, shall be used in programs where abortion is a method of family planning. In other words, um, you can get federal grant money to, uh, uh, for family planning clinics but there's a condition that the money can't be used for abortions. Now, before 1988, the Department of Health and Human Services interpreted this provision to ban only federal funds for programs that directly provided abortions. In other words, you couldn't use taxpayer dollars to perform abortions. But in 1988, and so remember, we're now in um, Reagan's second term, uh, Health and Human Services, after a notice and comment period, uh, um, promulgated a rule that prohibited federal grant recipients from even giving advice about or making referrals concerning abortion. So what had been happening before this is some of the clinics that would get grant money would still um, talk to patients about the option of getting an abortion and and then had doctors in the area that abortion providers that they would refer them out to or would refer them to Planned Parenthood or Planned Parenthood would take the grant money and then refer um, patients out to doctors that were kind of in their network, so to speak. So a group of doctors and women seeking abortions challenged the rule as unconstitutional on First Amendment free speech grounds, because remember, we're basically saying you're not allowed to talk about something if you're going to get the, um, this taxpayer grant money, and also on Fifth Amendment due process grounds, and as exceeding the department's authority under Title 10. Now, on the statutory issue, Rehnquist's majority opinion asserted that this case is governed by Chevron. Um, in other words, that, that rule that says courts should defer to agency interpretations of their own statutes uh, that, or statutes addressed to that agency. 
and that the text of Title 10 is ambiguous and that the agency's interpretation is reasonable. On the constitutional arguments in the case, the majority also concludes that Title 10, as in, even as interpreted by the agency, is constitutional. In other words, they don't see a constitutional problem in this case with what the agency is doing. And for those of you who like to find a great quote to focus on or zero in on in the opinion here, I've um, flagged one for you. A doctor employed by the project may be prohibited in the course of his project duties from counseling abortion or referring for abortion. And this is not a case of the government suppressing a dangerous idea but of a prohibition on a project grantee or its employee from engaging in activities outside of its scope. Now we have a dissenting opinion um, by uh, two of the justices, Blackman and Marshall, who said that the rule actually does violate the first and fifth amendments. And I, I, in this video, I'm not gonna get into the constitutional arguments and some of you may have studied this case in your constitutional law class. Um, more relevant for our purposes here is the fact that Justice Blackmun's dissent, as well as separate dissents from Justice Stevens and Justice O'Connor, invoked the avoidance canon. And what they basically said was, <clears throat> we, we think that there's a constitutional problem here, and either it, it, what the agency is doing violates the Constitution, or it may violate the Constitution, and depending on which justice we're talking about, which dissent, we could be, um, we shouldn't defer to an agency's interpretation when it's a debatable point whether what the agency is doing is constitutional. Now, I, again, I want to note something just to avoid confusion for my students. It's unclear that the court's approach to abortion in this case is still good law. We've had a lot of um, uh, uh, Supreme Court cases about abortion um, since then and uh, since Russ v. Sullivan. And we've also it very recently um, had some changes in personnel on the court. And so by the time my students are watching this video, the, the rules may have changed again or the court's position on abortion may have changed again. Um, in recent cases, the court has been using a different standard than it uses in the majority uses in this case to evaluate abortion restrictions. And I will leave it at that and leave it to your con law case uh, class or your First Amendment class to analyze um, the constitutional issue itself in Russ v. Sullivan. On the other hand, the court does continue to cite this case for the point about avoidance and Chevron and even as recently as 2019. So arguably the court's ruling here is much broader than just abortion and family planning services. If the government pays for a program, if we're taking taxpayer dollars and giving that money to private entities or corporations or businesses or um, nonprofits, the court is basically saying here that the government can attach pretty substantive restrictions on speech by employees of the program. And as an illusion, we do um, uh, with legal service uh, corporation grants, when we give money to legal aid clinics or law school clinics, we don't um, necessarily restrict what they're allowed to say, the speech, and we don't have a gag rule in the same way we do here, but there's a lot of things that you can't do if you are a grant recipient. Uh, uh, types of legal services or legal advice you can't give if you are going to accept that grant. And if you don't like it, the idea is you don't have to take the grant. Now, <clears throat> connecting this with another case that I teach in, in my class, um, De Bartolo, um, that uh, is about a very similar idea. There's some uncertainty about the interaction between Chevron and the avoidance canon. And some courts have some latitude in characterizing the seriousness of the constitutional problem, which offers them some flexibility to give Chevron deference to an agency interpretation that arguably raises a constitutional problem. In other words, for my students reading this case with some of the other cases in our book, you may start to feel confused about does Chevron apply or not um, because there's other cases where the Supreme Court has really um, said emphatically that the avoidance canon um, uh, prevails over Chevron, right? Comes first or can cancel out Chevron. But what's happening here is 
constitutional problems are a little bit in the eye of the beholder and Justice Rehnquist doesn't think there is a, says there is no constitutional problem so we don't have to extra exercise constitutional avoidance. And for my students, keep in mind like that the nine justices on the Supreme Court in this case couldn't agree, didn't agree with each other about whether there was a constitutional problem. And so the question then is, do we um, engage in avoid, if nine justices can't agree about whether we have a constitutional debate um, at hand in a, a given case, should we go at, should that trigger the avoidance canon? But the majority here says we're in the majority and we don't see a constitutional problem. And so we don't need to invoke the avoidance canon. And so we can give Chevron deference. Okay, oh, we're almost done here, I promise. Um, the, this case uh, I, I mentioned is still being quoted. And so we have a United States v. Davis opinion from 2019 from the Supreme Court. And in footnote six, it refers to Rust v. Sullivan and mentions, I, and I'm saying, I'm pulling this quote out just for my students to keep in mind, the avoidance canon is a complicated area of statutory interpretation. And here's the court's kind of latest um, reflection on this. There are at least two different canons of construction that sometimes go by the name constitutional avoidance. I actually think it's more like three or four, but they're saying there's at least two. The one, it, the one the government invokes here is perhaps better term, the presumption of constitutionality. Of long lineage, it holds that courts should, if possible, interpret ambiguous statutes to avoid rendering them unconstitutional. In other words, the original avoidance canon, the first time when we first see Supreme Court justices talking about avoidance or that we should avoid things or that there's a canon like this, they're basically saying interpret the statute um, if you can to avoid um, it, uh, an, an interpretation that would then make the statute unconstitutional. In other words, kind of give statutes the benefit of the doubt constitutionally. And then the court continues in this 2019 quote, that's distinct from the more modern and more debated constitutional doubt canon, they're calling it, um, which suggests courts should construe ambiguous statutes to avoid the need even to address serious questions about their constitutionality. And then it cites Rust v. Sullivan. And so the discussion of the, or, or the expression of the avoidance canon um, that we see in Rust v. Sullivan is definitely the more aggressive avoidance um, or uh, that we see um, in the late 20th century or late 1900s. Okay, here's a quick review question to see if my students have been paying attention. If a court decides that an agency's rule does not violate the constitution, even if this is a somewhat debatable point, can it then give Chevron deference to the agency's statutory interpretation that was the basis for the rule? Yes or no, hopefully you know the answer. If not, maybe you need to review this video. In other words, can the court decide um, that there's no constitutional problem first and then just proceed with Chevron. Okay, that concludes our video about Rust v. Sullivan.